Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from three exceptionally exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. From Belgium, bonjour. And Cara. From Germany, hello. And I'm your host, Fen, on an island in the Baltic Sea. And today we're going to be talking about Etherfields, Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, and the search for Planet X. But we'll first start up with a, a little catch. I've been sick like a dog for the past couple of days, so I apologize if my voice is not um, uh, is reflecting that. Um, other than that, uh, not too much. I've mostly been uh, walking, uh, getting back, uh, getting back into the, the gist of things after a few days of uh, vacation. Um, um, well, I'm uh, still in the process of you know organizing stuff and and cleaning up my my flat. Uh, throwing things away I don't need anymore and stuff like that. Um, apart from that, I uh, started uh, Japanese archery, Kudo. Uh, uh, started uh, Japanese archery, Kudo, um, which I'm really excited about. Um, though it it also means I haven't touched a bow yet because in in this type of archery it takes like four five six yet because in in this type of archery it takes like four five six months of training until you are ready to actually touch a bow and um so that's something um yeah in a uh, board game related news i have um yeah in a uh, board game related news i have um played my first game of sakura arms a, a two-player you know like competitive fighting game 20 minutes um which was fun and uh, so started playing lands of gelsia which i'm sure we'll talk about in the future because it's a really nice game and um yeah right now i'm actually involved a lot in tabletop games. Um, I talked about X-Wing before, which I continue to play. And actually tomorrow I will um, play another game of Star Wars Armada. So I have to finish my list later. Um, and I'm currently very much thinking about starting Star Wars Legion, you know, just having the trifecta of Star Wars complete and um, maybe take this as an opportunity to try maybe again to paint miniatures. What about you, Fan? Well, um, given the world's current energy situation, a fair bit of time stocking up wood. We have a, a proper wood heated house here. We can run a heat pump, but uh, considering how much expensive it was last year, that's not really a viable option. Um, and it's turned out everybody else on the island has had the same thought. Jump ahead in the queue and secure enough, so filling up a shed, um, which is, it's been a lot of carrying wood around. Uh, that's been fun. Uh, I have given up on trying to keep my Marvel Champions organised without from the UK, which is the reason I was constantly trying to hold off on it, because customs, you know, uh, like so many of the Etsy stores that I look at and go, I'd love to get stuff from this, I have a look, and they're based in the UK, um, because Etsy doesn't filter the UK out when you click Europe as an option, because tech. Because technically the UK is in is in Europe. Well, I should say Great Britain is in Europe. The UK is not in the European Union. So, <clears throat> but they look very nice. And my only other option was to basically order what looked like a set of Chinese knockoffs of them. For also an Etsy, which seemed Chinese knockoffs of them. For also an Etsy, which seemed a bit peculiar. So I'll talk about them when they arrive. Um, but it's just. Is you just need to divide so many different things up and the main thing I'm holding off on now is I don't want to get a box. There's the X-Men landing, uh, there's the X-Men landing um, at the end of September and 
So that should supply me with another box. So I'm just going to start using that one and continue filling them up for now. Uh, I would get myself a like proper box to hold it all, but they only they're only available in wood really right now. Hold it all, but they only they're only available in wood really right now. I want a cardboard one, so I'm going to get that. So all of that. Uh, my lands of Galzia arrived literally yesterday, and I still haven't finished sleeving all of the cards that come in the game. I did find setup to be a little. I did find setup to be a little finicky because I think my cards were in the wrong order. They were like weirdly not in numerical order, so I had to resort all of that before putting them away. Um, and. We have just restarted playing Oathsworn. We have just restarted playing Oathsworn. Um, and got as far as the second chapter, running the full story stuff. Um, the app is very well narrated, which isn't surprising considering who did it. But I'll be honest, chapter two sucked as much as it sucked to play the quick version. It actually, like, if I, I can't see myself ever wanting to replay that chapter in full story, but also I think maybe I once I've played through the full story once, there doesn't seem much benefit to playing through the full story again because repeatable really, unless you wait a very long time. So I am, I'm wondering how much the game's going to hold up for lots of replays, but I still think it's great value for money, even if you just play it once. So that's. Uh, there with that um, and where Dr. Statler and whoever Jeff Goldblum's character is like Malcolm um, he dies in the book but he doesn't in the TV show TV show? Film film. Um, anyway uh, they fight against a T-Rex which is like the weirdest thing ever to pick like the previous Jurassic Park one was right. Ra in Gen versus Raptors, yeah. And it makes sense because that's the, I forget his name, but that's the character who says the very famous line, clever girl. Um, yes, yeah, he's one of them and he's fighting against the Raptors and that's like thematically Brit. Yeah, that's, that makes sense. I don't know what Dr. Statler and, and Malcolm, Dr. Malcolm are doing, like, and, and Malcolm, Dr. Malcolm are doing, like, fighting a T-Rex. But... It, it, it's still fun. It's just conceptually a bit weird. It's not like like I, I, the T Rex isn't the problem. It's Doctor Statler who I'm like, well, well, you could take Doctor Statler and now you could fight um, Bloody. Ma you could take Doctor Statler and now you could fight um, Bloody Mary or the Invisible Man or Luke Cage. And I know unmatched. That's kind of the concept. But this she's the last person I would have pegged for a fighting game. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's quite. Yeah, yeah, so it's it's quite fun. She doesn't really feel like she's fighting when you play her either. So, uh, yeah, that's that's most of it. Oh, and I finally replaced my copy of Elder Sign. My my previous copy got coffeed. Uh, exactly two board games coffeed. Uh, exactly two board games in my entire history of playing board games have had incidents with coffee and it's always been me who spilt the coffee. Um, uh, Power Grid's the other one and that one got through it thanks to sleeves but Elder Sign did not. Uh, so I finally replaced it because it's one of my favourite like just... Uh, so I finally replaced it because it's one of my favourite like just sit down solo Yahtzee games. It's just got that right mix of a bit of randomness and exploration and very good push your luck mechanics. So, yeah, that. Boom. <laughs> that's, that's what I've been up to. And when we finish this, I'm going to unload another truck of wood, another half tonne of wood, like 500 kilograms-ish, or whatever it is. But, yeah, it's, um, that's going to be fun. So, yeah, that's me. That's done. Yeah, having a wood, um, oh, mm -hmm. yeah, having a wood oven is definitely a good thing right now. <laughs> very angry at us for doing it uh because he's very environmentally conscious um but i've like it's not the little people who have to use a wood stove to warm themselves over the winter who are causing all the problems that we have with the, with the environment even collectively if you put us all together uh, so it is what it is and at least the house is well insulated so 
hopefully we don't have to start using it till November. But yeah. <clears throat> oh, I uh, forget to say something um, during my part of the uh, catch up. Um, I, I always do this. I kind of, uh, my first game of Blood on the Clock Tower, and I actually did, though um, with less people than expected. I had only five players, so yeah. But it was still fun, way more fun than uh, Werewolf. Um, so yeah, I hope I will, way more fun than uh, Werewolf. Um, so yeah, I hope I will someday uh, build on this experience and have some more players. Yeah, I've had a little bit of an extra wrinkle in respect to that because I convinced myself I wasn't going to get it because... Uh, wrinkle in respect to that because I convinced myself I wasn't going to get it because all the import fees and everything. But now my local game store is going to get some copies in and that means I can get it without shipping and without import fees. And I'm like, oh no. <laughs> the, the barriers which like, oh no. <laughs> That the barriers which are in place and not present anymore. Remember, if I buy this, I'm never going to play it. I get to watch it quite a fair bit, and I can I can play it online, but I'm never going to get to play it physically. Short of like holding the Gotland Convention, which short of like holding the Gotland Convention, which is complete anathema to me. So, yeah. watch this space i guess but um it's time for us to get on to our main topics and i'm going time for us to get on to our main topics and i'm going first for once because i decided to put myself going first um <clears throat> and so tuck yourself in dear listeners because we're going to explore the dream world of ether fields and if i was going to and if I was going to call this game anything, I would say mixed and inconsistent, um, both in the experience of playing it and um, in just like the review responses people have had to it, like the review responses people have had to it. So that is, if Fields is, mm, yeah, that is definitely not a box quote. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, so it is a one to four player with a, an optional fifth player expansion, adventure game, player expansion, adventure game, almost deck building dungeon crawler. Almost. Um, you are, you wake up in a dreamland, you'd have no idea how you got there, you have no idea who. Uh, you are idea who uh, you are, really. You're just this archetype of this particular individual. And you gradually explore this world of dreams through instant, instant adventure slash dungeons built out of card tiles. And um, it's got, I think, eight, yes, eight spaces. You start off with two of them and you find the others as you explore. And it's... Uh, it's sometimes it's really good and sometimes it's really bad and overall i'm having a great time playing it but i with because single player yeah yeah single player it's incredibly um engaging with just has the right level of writing for me where it's a little bit of text I've been using a community app to read rather so I don't have to have the storybook to flip, just read off there, which I find helps make it the process a lot easier. Just pick up my phone and boom. Um, it even can read out loud if you want it to, but it uses those generic, uh, slightly computerized voices. Um, so not a proper, not a proper reading, not a narration, reading, not a narration like Oathsworn or... Uh, Midara, but um, it's definitely helped. In fact, I just turned the narration off so I can just read it. I've experienced at this point, I think a third of the game seems about right. I know what the game seems about right. 
I know what the like final objective is. I know what uh, I'm looking for, and I found a few of them. Just being vague, because a big part of this game is kind of just exploring as you go, and it is a game that you want to avoid spoiling anything. It is a game that you want to avoid spoiling anything, really. Um, without that mystery and the big mystery of why am I here and the little mysteries of what is this dream about, I think the game wouldn't hold up at all as an experience. Um, you know, so I'm going to avoid talking. Uh, I will get into a few bits and pieces about mechanics and so on. Have either of you had any experience with this? Uh, I have not, because when the campaign uh, shipped, I was still waiting for, um, uh, what's the name of the other game? Uh, and I, I had some uh, worries about Eva Field because it did look very inconsistent from the outside. I think that they had a demo that I played uh, briefly. Yes. Um, and I thought that the mechanics seemed a bit uh, obviously complex and a bit... Um, uh, yeah, um, but I quite liked the oniric, uh, dreamy uh, aspect of the game. Uh, that's actually a question that I had for you. You mentioned that you enjoyed the game solo. Um, have you played with multiple players? And how complex is the um, the the card jet solo player? Right. Um, so it's not too bad. Like setup teardowns, pretty quick uh, for just about everything. Um, so as a solo player, it's not been too hard to handle. I've played multi-handed, so I could get a grip with what it's like with several players, um, which I didn't find particularly overloading personally, because deck builder hands at the same time. Um, so yeah, I got it. It definitely feels like the game tries to scale upwards for more players to make it a bit more difficult. Some of the checks have like a scaling number, much like uh, say Marvel Champions, where it's like. This is based on the number of players yeah. set in uh, Arkham Horror as well. And here, it doesn't quite work because, as it turns out, the more players you have, the more ground you can cover. And some of these, like, some of these dreams are on a bit of a timer. Um, well, all of them are on a timer, but some of them are really on a, a right timer. And having more people involved just made it easier. Um, and also you could specialize how the players go uh, built and how their decks are constructed and give everyone kind of a role. And as I'm sure you're very familiar, any game where you can concentrate and force your character into a role generally allows you to make that concentrate and force your character into a role generally allows you to make that character very powerful because specializing is always strong. Uh, so... I think two to three players might be the sweet spot between like balance and still feeling like you're doing a lot. Balance and still feeling like you're doing a lot. Um, especially because the game gives you the option of, hi, you can either play a fixed turn structure, if that's how you like it, or you can play a loose one where everyone does their action and you go back and forth until everyone's finished with actions and then it's time for the until everyone's finished with actions and then it's time for the the games phase to to do its thing for the monsters to act all so, right yeah um <clears throat> did, did you play it Cam? um no i haven't i'm actually trying to remember why i didn't back it maybe i backed a lot of other games remember why i didn't back it maybe i backed a lot of other games when it was on kickstarter um but uh, once I um, I know after the Kickstarter, I kind of was put off by what I read and heard about the rule book. <laughs> I kind of was put off by what I read and heard about the rule book. <laughs> yeah, so I got wave two stuff, which means I never have had to deal with the first edition rule book. Um, it is pretty abysmal the abysmal but the second version edition comes with a new updated rule book that lays everything out in a far more understandable fashion and it's i feel a lot clearer um the first rule book had an index but um that didn't help totally 
that seems to be something that Awaken Realm I cannot say that the rule book is in any way uh, clear or yeah. uh, same for uh, Tinted Grail and I've not played any uh, yeah I've, I've played um, this war of mine and I also think that it is a bit uh, a confusing uh, per time I think that the evil field is uh, made by the this war of mine uh, so uh, but that is not something I checked to uh, be honest yes, yeah, yes he is um, my, Mikhail Horax or so um, yeah did this war of mine BS yes. downfall sorry for putting you on the spot fan. it's alright and I didn't bother for me because I was just like I can't be bothered to have the board game page open I had I just forgot um, so that's fine it's fine uh, yeah I, I've got to say this war of mine I think is overall actually uh, a better game I have that um, but it's really bleak. Watching the computer games feel of like sort of hopelessness. Um, and I think this one of mine generates better emergent storytelling. But Ether Fields has a nicely crafted story experience. Um, I'll have to fully like, play through the whole starting campaign. Um, because I'm at least intrigued enough by the individual dreams and I've seen a little bit of the full picture and it's that kind of writing I like where it's not too heavy, it's leaving bits to sort of think about, maybe they'll fill them in later, maybe they won't and that's kind of feels dreamlike. Like the deck building in this, I, I really think it's something quite interesting. You get your starting deck of 20 cards and they have on the back of them a special ability that only your character has your archetype whatever um and you can activate them while that's on top of the deck um and you can activate them while that's on top of the deck any new influence cards you get i think they're called influence cards um they don't have that on the back they might have some indicators uh, if you've gained them from a particular dream, which means you immediately know what that card is on the top because it's actually got a little top right corner. Immediately know what that card is on the top because it's actually got a little top right corner unique identifier. So this is something I always appreciate. It's in a game where um, hiding the information of a card is not that desirable. Uh, putting little hints of what's coming up is... Uh, putting little hints of what's coming up is is very interesting and useful. You know, I'm looking and going, okay, so next turn I know I'm drawing this card or I've got an archetype card on top there that I can use for an extra ability. And the same thing pans across to the enemies where what they're going to do while it varies is face up. Where what they're going to do while it varies is face up on the time card. So you know, you, you know where they're going to go uh, what they what order they're going to do everything in, and I I just really appreciated that. It's a uh, it, it lets you think a lot more about what's going on. It lets you think a lot more about what's going on. So, the other part I really like about the deck building is you can go up to forty cards. Normal rule in a deck builder is, in fact, in any card game, is put as few cards in your deck as possible, keep at the minimum. But Ether Fields. Uh, just like Arkham, but Ether Fields, uh, just like Arkham harms you every time you cycle through your deck. Um, in Arkham, it's not so much of a big deal, but in Ether Fields, you take a wound. If you take eight wounds total, you're, you're out. If somebody goes out, the dream fails. Or if you take collectively sixteen wounds between you, your deck becomes a benefit, and the game becomes more about having a consistent deck, not a small consistent deck. So you're kind of consciously thinking, what cards do I have available for this character? What's going in this deck to support what they're doing? What cards occasionally get the option to like resell a card? And that's like interesting as well, but ultimately you might have like 60, 80 cards and you pick 40 of them to, to really do, this is what my character's gonna do. So I like that a lot. I like how each archetype has a few specific cards unique to them along with their back of card ability. It uh, tough guy who like just endures taking wounds and does a bit of, like is a bit more heavy on the physical side of things. I played with the free spirit who I thought was super cool. Uh, she gets to break the rules of the dreams. Um, one of the things she can do is 
pop down her personal symbol with pop down her personal symbol with by playing a card and it she can count it as any type of symbol that it is in the dream so you can turn the location into a swamp if you want to or um a spawning point i think is one of the options but it, it gives you a lot of like flexibility and she also really coolly has sort of like flexibility and she also really coolly has another card that just says i'm done with this dream if everyone agrees we can just leave um which is i thought really thematic but the main character i played with was the reaper she's the fifth extra character uh she worked really well in the solo playthrough section she worked really well in the solo playthrough section because she builds on taking wounds and becomes more and more powerful the more wounds she has so you're rewarded for taking damage um and that makes for quite an explosive and interesting character. I feel one that could probably be broken near the end of the game. If you one that could probably be broken near the end of the game, if you do everything correctly and you know combo your deck out properly. But you know I'm cool with breaking characters in cooperative games. It's all fun. Uh, Celeste, so um, you'll have individual dreams. They will be based on a small. You'll have individual dreams. They will be based on a small selection of cards, usually four to six tile cards, the square cards. Some of them will be revealed to start with. Some of them you will unlock as you go along. Some of them you might only unlock as a reward for winning. Um, if you fail a dream, they added in... The, if you fail a dream, they added in the second edition a little thing called... Um, uh, I forget. Power Nap. And you can put this power nap card on the dream and you don't have to get any of the prerequisites to get back in. Because usually you have to collect enough keys to enter the dream. This is like, oh, things went wrong and just go again, which I appreciated. Um, that's a good addition to the 2.0 because it lets you play the game you want to play. If you don't want to have to collect all the keys again, which can be a laborious process because you have to get them from slumbers. More on that in a moment. Um... But instead, it's just like, hey. Then there's the world map. The world map has a bunch of different routes. It has arrows that you move around. And each area is like a neighborhood with its own flavor. Um, each card. It's pretty cool. Uh, I can see why people get frustrated with it. Because uh, uh, you have to get multiple. It seems to be two at the moment. That means you have to go to two points and have a slumber. Um, when you draw a slumber, there's this big deck red back deck of tiles and you'll flip up a card and usually it's going to be some kind of encounter fight you have to have with a dream creature you start off with one of those in your deck uh, the wraith uh, which appears to have some form of connection with the characters and then the others are like just oh if somebody's done this then you're going to have to add a card to the deck otherwise the slumber ends they're, they're a delight early on uh, but as you complete dream, the light early on. Uh, but as you complete dreams, sometimes characters and things from those dreams will enter the slumber deck. So you you gradually build this portfolio of enemies that are sort of trailing you around. Um, some of them can be gotten rid of with a mechanic in the game. Some of them can be gotten rid of with a mechanic in the game. Um, but you have to puzzle out exactly which way you're going to operate this mechanic. It's like uh, an extra deck of cards you get and you can choose. I'm going to like be horribly violent against this, um, this entity. Or I'm going to try and reason with it. Or I'm going to try and open myself. I'm going to try and reason with it. Or I'm going to try and open myself to it or whatever. Um... And typically only one route is going to work against the given uh, entity in the slumber. You have to figure out which one is um, is the right fit for that. And there are contextual clues for that. And there are contextual clues, um, both in the dream they come from and in sort of the way they behave. And in fact, the whole game's like that. It's, um, it bakes sections of its puzzle into the tiles on the board. So there'll be little sections of wording that's like it does actually it's actually relevant. The wording that's like it does actually it's actually relevant. It might be telling you don't interact with this thing that's on the board. Uh, you know, so if you go around prodding every single thing in the game, you're going to have a miserable time because sometimes they exist just to be like you shouldn't have done that. Take a punishment. 
but it's fair because other like non-text visual clues on on the various tiles if you see something um it can actually help you figure out puzzles or it might be something you can interact with later so i, I like that i like the visual section of the storytelling the game builds a world the, a way a mechanic in 2.0 that if you're not happy with the slumbers you can play this continuous dreaming mode and it lets you basically skip most of the slumber and you take a little bit of damage or you have to seal a few cards which is a mechanic where you take cards off the top of your deck and put them in a pile they're not available until you have an awake your jam which most people don't like the slumbers and i can see why because they tend to get very repetitive um, but they do exist to, to give you a chance to put like progress cards in play which are cards that have a permanent ability or like a temporary one-shot extra powerful ability um, version of it up in the new version you put it down as a progress card and you can spend it to do these uh, to do these various abilities and yeah the crowbar is a is one of many fun little creative things where it's literally a crow holding a bar well crow holding the crowbar um, stuff like that's kind of the crowbar um, stuff like that's kind of neat and cute um, but that like you see all of these ways that the designers have added into the second edition the rule book cleanup that's just a good positive but power nap and just a good positive but power nap and continuous dream mode on one hand they give you more options on how you want to engage with the game and i'm a big advocate for let the players decide how they want to interact with your game let them set the difficulty and let them experience the content in the way they want and let them experience the content in the way they want to so it's great but also every single fix seems to be around the slumbers and maybe the slumbers are just a failed mechanic because i must admit i like seeing the slumber dreamscape gradually become bigger and bigger as you unlock more parts of it by completing dreamscape gradually become bigger and bigger as you unlock more parts of it by completing dreams but I don't much care for many of the slumber encounters. Like, one of them's a dude who you've got to make him fill a load of spaces up with dirt. And as the slumber gets bigger, that gets more and more frustrating. Um, it gets more and more frustrating. Um, uh, it's, it's, eh. it's eh. Sometimes I'm in the mood for it, sometimes I'm not. But the artwork, the world, the writing... Uh, the mystery, the just right level of this feels like a dream keeps me coming back to it. Dream keeps me coming back to it. So I can't recommend this game because it's not for everyone. And, you know, if, you, if you're somebody who gets frustrated by what seems to be busy work, and it kind of is, then you're not going to click kind of is, then you're not going to click well with this game and you should just not worry about it but if you do if you are interested still and you're like oh yes please you just need to get the base box the core box nothing else the creatures of ether fields box is absolutely else the creatures of ether fields box is absolutely pointless it's just a bunch of pretty miniatures um you don't need miniatures for the enemies in the game at all uh the the game base game comes with several that are like generic that just says like use these models to represent a certain thing and the more unique characters these models to represent a certain thing and the more unique characters come with tokens i think miniatures are great for the player piece because you want a 3d thing to hold on to to ease moving it around because you do move them around a lot um but yeah you don't need that and all of the other expansions apart from the fifth player who as i said i suspect is broken possibly overpowered um, when set up so um, I don't think you need her but she's cool um, it, it's it's kind of like you could part live without it and all of the other boxes they're for campaigns that take place after you've completed the core campaign you really have to enjoy ether fields to get anywhere near the extra campaign boxes so don't don't bother getting them unless you play the original ether fields and you go I love this I want more of this you know um, so 
Uh, I haven't talked about a whole bunch of things. It's like each character has a lucid dreaming superpower. Plenty of mystery card unlocking. Um, so that that's the big draw for me is where's this story going? And on the physical front, the box is kind of okay. Um, apparently they say it's suitable for sleeved cards. Um, apparently they say it's suitable for sleeved cards. I've only sleeved the player decks because that's the only, and the time decks, that's the only things that really get shuffled and handled a lot. The rest, you don't really shuffle most of the time. Um, and they've obviously worked very hard to try and design, fit everything into the box, but it never quite fits in a satisfying manner. Fit everything into the box, but it never quite fits in a satisfying manner. And they didn't even put spaces to fit the fifth character into the box. Either you can keep this whole massive, like, giant box for a fifth character and her deck and a few cards, or you can do what I do and just let the miniature sit, like, floating around. I do and just let the miniature sit, like, floating around inside the box because, well, but miniatures to represent her because she has one for a normal form and one for her lucid dreaming form. Um, yeah. That's... That's something that was also a problem in um, uh, Tinted Grail, uh, a little bit less in uh, ne Tinted Grail, uh, a little bit less in uh, Nemesis, but I, I think that was also present in Nemesis, is that the box are not very well designed. And I don't think that every game needs to have like a perfectly fitting, uh, super well-made box, but I always find it a bit. I always find it a bit annoying when I don't really know where to put the decks, and when you have like ten different types of decks, and you're kind of forced to have every single card to get uh, close together, uh, mixing them. Uh, I don't know. Well, some games like this, I feel could use yeah. a bit more. Feel could use yeah. a bit more uh, thought on that end. Yeah. Well, Ether Fields does provide some very clear dividers. It's just understanding how to set up those dividers initially was a little bit of a oof moment um and when i went to have a look online to see like if it's, they'd taken a couple of photos and said look this is how you do it without sleeves this is how you do it with sleeves and uh, i looked and i was like huh okay i'm just gonna do it in my own way and figure it out um, i i was wondering also um how long it took you to go through most of the main campaign? It should be around fifty hours, forty to fifty okay. hours. Yeah, that's quite a that's quite a good uh, good amount of time. Yeah, I've uh, pl I played around ten to fifteen hours. I said, and I think I've seen a third of the content, which is on track for about a forty fifty hour run. Do you do you feel like there's any um, main mystery? Basically, uh, uh, the only reason to get into it um i think mechanically because the slumber phase is so clunky and you can bounce off it really hard depending on your mood and what kind of person you are uh, um not really i think it, it's you replaying this kind of game you would get to build you could play one of the other characters if you haven't swapped part with your campaign or you, you know um you might want to explore some of the sections of the dreams that you haven't been through because I'm not explore some of the sections of the dreams that you haven't been through because I'm not somebody who prods every single lever and pulls every you know single button um, just to put those the wrong way around. Uh, I, I just like to move through and experience stuff and just be like, OK, fine, I've seen some of it. So in that case, I know I've missed some content. So in that case, I know I've missed some content because I've been putting cards behind the dividers that I've never looked at, behind the lost from the game divider. Uh, so there may be some replayability in that front, but for me, because I picked up um, it's like a Kickstarter Wave 2 set of content, when I finish this, I've, it's like a Kickstarter Wave 2 set of content, when I finish this, I've got four campaigns that I could dip into, uh, which try and mix things up a bit. So... I would say probably not replayable, but for some people it might be because the customization of how you build your character by getting extra cards, because the customization of how you build your character by getting extra cards is a nice draw. It's always fun to construct a deck 
with a goal in mind and have it go off. But that's something that can be exp explored in the um, in the other campaign rather than. Uh, yeah. There's no real draw to. An, uh, yeah. There's no real draw to get through the main campaign again. No, no. I mean, okay. the, the game's easily resettable, which is nice. You know, everything's clearly labeled and marked. Um, so there's that. And there are a few secret envelopes, but it's very easy to repack those as well. But yeah, I, I don't think back to it. Okay, so a, a good um, a good game to play if you become a, an amnesiac protagonist in a JRPG. Yeah, or an amnesiac dreamer in a board game. <laughs> yes, that too. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, to finally note it then, love the art. Um, if that appeals, then you might be able to find this. And if you do, try and get it cheap secondhand. I'm sure there are people who either bounced off it or who have finished it who are looking to sell it. Um, though, having said that, I'd like to warn you, the cards are not... It's one of my. It's one of the most fun and engaging times I've had with a game that I would not recommend to anyone. Mixed. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, so that's Ether Fields, and we should wake up because it's time for more adventure of the fantasy kind. In this time with Kara and Gloomhaven, Jaws of the. 2017 Gloomhaven came out. This uh, big reddish box um, of excitement and possibilities that a lot of people have lying around at home some of those have actually started playing and very few of those have finished playing um, just from person started playing and very few of those have finished playing um, just from personal experience i know four people who own the game in one case they actually played it um, <laughs> And um, the other just don't find it. Um, <laughs> and um, the other just don't find the time to start. So, um, does that include me on that list? No. Okay, so five people I know have the game. Have you played Gloomhaven? Yeah, I've played Gloomhaven. Have the game. Have you played Gloomhaven? Yeah, I've played Gloomhaven. I finished completed it? Jaws. I finished Jaws of the Lion. I didn't finish Gloomhaven because I uh, didn't enjoy the characters. Okay. I got tired with it. But okay, so Jaws of the Lion, I did. Um, a big criticism of Gloomhaven was that it's Jaws of the Lion. I did. Um, a big criticism of Gloomhaven was that it's you know too big. <laughs> um, basically, people started and just didn't find the time to finish it. At least from what I heard. And um, then came in 2020 Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, a um, standalone game. In 2020 Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, a um, standalone game set in Gloomhaven and um, placed uh, in, in the time before the events of the Gloomhaven game. Um, it's smaller, its price point is somewhere around it's smaller, its price point is somewhere around, I think I paid 65 euros. Um, and, um, you know, the smaller in scope, in length, um, it has 25 total scenarios. So if you play a campaign, um, you play three, I think, um, depending on choices. Um, so you don't play all of these scenarios if you play it through once. And yeah, it uses uh, mostly the same mechanics as Gloomhaven, is a little bit streamlined and um, made simpler. That the uh, weight on Board Game Geek is 3.6, while Gloomhaven has 3.8. Uh, there's not that much difference, apparently. Ben, correct me if I'm wrong. And um, yeah, so. Gloomhaven, Jaws of Lion. It's a crawl game with surrounding story that connects the different scenarios. Um, and um, I have to say, I only played the first five scenarios for now, which um, build the uh, tutorial, basically. 
uh, you are confronted with more and more rules. So you start with very limited rules and are told to, you know, just ignore this and don't bother with that and no, don't worry. And if that happens, well, just go there and we'll explain how this works. But for now, uh, it doesn't matter. And um, the cards, the ability cards, you start with all the blue boxes, which exactly explain what these things do. So you don't have to look stuff up and that's really great. And um, as far as the story goes, I'd say these first five scenarios already build a consistent and a kind of finished story of like, you know, uh, Star Wars episode four. Um, it's a finished story, but of course there is some hint. So, hey, it's not over. Yeah. So that's like the, uh, this uh, tutorial. Um, now, um, the core mechanic of play is the cards. Each character has ability cards. Um, how many depends on the character, um, around 10 cards you have in hand and each card has a top section and a bottom section. When it's uh, a new, new round, every player chooses two cards from their hand to use when it's their turn. And of those, those two cards, of one card they have to use the top action, of the other card they have to use the bottom action, which they use they can decide once it's their turn and they pick the cards. And on the cards, there's also a big number in the middle, which is your initiative. So you decide of the two cards, which of those you use as initiative number. So you, everyone picks their cards, then you flip enemy ability cards, uh, which also have an initiative number. Uh, you flip enemy ability cards, uh, which also have an initiative number. Um, so then you can, uh, determine which is the initiative order. Everyone takes their turn in this round. And once it's your turn, you look at your cards, look at the, uh, look at the map and decide, okay, um, turn, you look at your cards, look at the, uh, look at the map and decide, okay, um, I will use this top action of this card. And after that, I use this bottom action of this card. And then you discard them. So next turn, you have two cards less to choose from. And this continues until you only have one or so next turn you have two cards less to choose from. And this continues until you only have one or zero cards left. So you can't pick two cards and then you have to make a rest. There is a long rest or a short rest. Um, basically of the discarded cards, one of those gets removed for this encounter card you discard. And um, yeah, this continues until you won the scenario or until every player runs, runs out of cards or is uh, knocked out. They don't die. Uh, if your health goes down to zero, um, it just means um, you repeat it. You keep everything you got until that point in the scenario and just start new until you win and then you continue in the story. Um, it technically is a legacy game. There is a map of uh, the city. Of, um, I'd personally argue that it doesn't make a lot of difference if you'd played the game with the stickers already on it because, okay, yeah, so you have the scenario numbers and titles or basically location and titles or basically location titles and if if any uh, if anything that would allow you to pick the choice that will lead to some scenarios that you haven't done i'm guessing yeah i mean sure if you play it once and you want to see the other scenarios of course you can look at your map sure if you play it once and you want to see the other scenarios of course you can look at your map and see hey which one did i actually choose um but um, like if you bought it second hand and you had this map and all the stickers were on it, it doesn't matter. Yeah? Um, I mean, you can still enjoy the game. Um, so don't be afraid of that if, if you want. Yeah? Um, I mean, you can still enjoy the game. Um, so don't be afraid of that if, if you want to buy it, but uh, the retail price is too high for you and you see it somewhere cheap in, in second hand. Um, um, yeah, so... Uh, 
the characters collect experience points. Um, yeah, so uh, the characters collect experience points. They level up. They um, improve their um, fighting deck. Basically, if you make an attack, you have on your ability card how much damage this attack deals, and then you draw a card from you. You have on your ability card how much damage this attack deals, and then you draw a card from your uh, combat deck, uh, which is just a deck of modifier cards. So either just a zero or plus one, minus one, plus two, minus two. And there are two special cards in it at the start. Minus one, plus two, minus two. And there are two special cards in it at the start. One is a you miss, so your attack is cancelled and one is a times two, so you double all your damage. And those two cards also let you reshuffle the deck. And um, if your character improves, you have a sheet where you can choose, okay, as my first improvement, I will remove two minus one cards from my deck, or I will exchange a plus one card for a plus two card with some special effect on it and stuff like that. So that's, um, that's nice. Um, same, if, if enemies attack, they also have yes, that. And if you're attacked and you notice, oh, this attack would kill me, you have always the option to discard, to, or to, to remove one of your cards from hand to cancel any damage you get. Um, which, of course, it's dangerous because it means you have one card less until you exhaust it and can somewhat mix. Uh, generally, I enjoy the uh, combat system. I like the, these cards, uh, you know, sitting there, okay, well, which cards do I use? There's always the option, um, if all your, all the cards you have don't suit you, you can always, as a top act action, choose a sim attack with two damage, or as a bottom action, you can always choose two movement. Um, so move two spaces. Um, but one thing I definitely dislike um, in this uh, system is um, there are in this uh, system is um, there are with with um, later cards you unlock when improving your character um, there are a lot of abilities that include this nice little card symbol with a red X, which means after you do this ability, include this nice little card symbol with a red X, which means after you do this ability, remove this card. So um, like one-time abilities, which is fine if it wasn't for the fact that the number of ability cards you have is also, you have is also like your lifeline. Uh, because every time you use this ability, you know, oh, now I'm one card closer to being exhausted. Um, so I noticed in my case, and I talked with someone else who played it, they had the same experience, that I kind of avoided using these abilities, and, um, either by taking different cards into combat or by using the standard abilities instead of these strong abilities. Um, just so I can last longer in the scenario. Um, yeah, um, I guess I have a problem, but it's just the way I, I tick. <laughs> um, I don't like basically hurting myself with my actions. So um, yeah. Also, I what I noticed in the last scenario I played in, in the fifth, basically the, the grand finale of Ali of um, the uh, tutorial where you have your first boss enemy. The game can be pretty swingy. I mean, I did set the whole scenario up um, like the way I played it. That okay, when I reach the boss, I will have my like the way I played it. That okay, when I reach the boss, I will have my strongest cards ready. And um, I exactly I planned like the next two turns through, and I decided, yeah, I'll just burst him down. So I went there. My first action, I made an attack. Uh, I drew the times two damage card, and so I went there. My first action, I made an attack. Uh, I drew the times two damage card, and I one shot at the boss. And I sat there and thought, did I do some rule wrong that I just one shot at 
the boss encounter, but I, I checked that I, I did everything right and did everything right and um, sure. So um, that was pretty anticlimactic. Um, so that's something I did not particularly like. Uh, <laughs> The story itself is okay, based with you coming back from a uh, um, uh, task you you had to follow up and uh, then you're just like drawn in um, into the story uh, which is connected to this uh, task you first started with where you were looking for some missing people. It's a nice story um, during the first five scenarios you don't have any decisions to make in regards to this story um, later on there is quite often that at the end of a scenario you unlock two new scenarios and you have to decide which one you want to take uh, where do you look and then you go at some at one point and miss out on the other scenario that's the reason why you don't play all 25 scenarios in one playthrough um, there's also the um, city events. Between each scenario you have a city phase where you can go see um, city events. Between each scenario you have a city phase where you can go shopping or spend um, or, or improve your characters, um, where you can trade items um, with each other or sell items to buy new items. Um, and it, um, with each other or sell items to buy new items um, and in this city phase you always draw an event card and I don't know why these cards are even there that reminds me of a cards are even there that reminds me of another couple of games with uh, event cards that feel like they're just a legacy of a uh, hero quest, but never really justify themselves. Yeah, like for example, I I I, I had my encounter and um, okay, now we have to go there and where I found the big boss, you know, and um, had the city phase in between, which is fine. Yeah, sure. We left the one place, went to the other, c could go to a store, like buy new stuff. That's fine. And then I had an, a city event where we went to a to have our stuff cleaned. Yeah, it didn't really uh, walk through the narrative that you, of what was happening. Yeah, especially one of the options which I took was like, oh yeah, I'll come back later. <laughs> Um, so yeah, don't worry. We have time. Just you know, balance. But uh, having a nice shiny armor is important. Um, so so that kind of yeah. I I don't know. It's uh, um, yeah. Other um, things I, I struggle with. Um, if you play like, two characters, um, which is fine though first of all some rules don't really seem to work with one character i i mean for example the rules clearly state you can't communicate with another with other players about the cards you choose uh statements uh especially regarding your initiative but if you play with two characters uh solo of course you know all the cards and the initiative of both characters so how am I supposed to follow this rule? And that's um, that's a rule that just tends to get ignored, even in yeah, it's uh, a stupid I rule. Would s I would say the best version of it I've seen is in Arkham Horror, where essentially people share almost perfect information a lot of the time. But in the path to Carcosa, there's specific cards that pop up that say uh, you may not talk about having this card, um, and it becomes clear you have to talk about having this card. Um, and it becomes clear you have a weird card in hand that's forcing you to do certain things, but you can't discuss it, which is um, kind of fun and very thematic. Uh, and Marvel has a similar mechanic called Peril, I think it is, where certain cards you'd always at Arkham, Arkham has Peril, I think it is, where certain cards you'd always at Arkham, Arkham has Peril. Anyway, there's a mechanic called Peril where if you draw a specific card, you have to make the decision with no help from anyone else. That's when I think it's nice when it's applied in a short moment 
it's it's frustrating to have it run all the time. So yeah, that's yeah. not something we bothered with when we played. Um, yeah, that's yeah. not something we bothered with when we played um, played Gloomhaven. Especially in a game that is supposed to be cooperative, it's sometimes uh, hiding information forces you to play a little bit too much on your uh, like in in your own limited uh, end in game. Uh, and the fun of cooperative games to say off that that especially in a game like Gloomhaven, where the encounters are kind of puzzly because you're on this card limit clock. And once you run out of cards, you're done. And if everyone runs out of cards, you'll fail. Not being able to communicate in a coordinate in a f somewhat efficient fashion is... Another part, which I just ignored. Um, the rules say you can, in the city phase, exchange items. You cannot exchange gold. That's strange. Yeah, so because during the, uh, like as a reward during a scenario, you might get gold and also during the scenario, you can get gold. Um, and of course, I kind of, oh yeah, this character is faster than the other, so he can just, you know, move around, collect the gold. And um, the rules say, the rules say they can't share the gold or pool it to buy something. I ignored that, stupid. Um, <laughs> yeah what happens if you do follow that rule is you designate one person usually like the scoundrel or thief type character in the original gloomhaven they run around hoovering up all of the gold and then they just buy it and become like you buy stuff and dish, dish anyone else having it unless there's no way the collector can get it so yeah it's uh yeah it, it, it's odd these limitations and it's understandable to forget about them. Um, apart from that, um, as I said, I, I generally like the combat. Um, it is somewhat fiddly, um, which are always applied until the um, person's like next action or, or like next turn, um, with some exceptions. Uh, but like, if you are confused, you if you attack, you have to draw two cards and choose the word. And yeah, I, I I did notice myself getting it it mixed up a, a couple of times, you know, forgetting a status or forgetting to remove a status, and um, and then there is the element part of, of the element system, um, which is I think introduced in the fourth. Uh, basically, some abilities infuse the battlefield with an element. There are six elements. Um, of course, we know the standard ones, fire, air, um, um, earth, and frost, because water is too mainstream, and uh, dark. And um, so if you have an ability that infuses the battlefield with fire, you move the fire token on the like infused place. And at the end of each round, it moves one space back. So there are three spaces. One is no element, one is infused, and one is, oh yeah, it's waning. And it's used, and one is, oh yeah, it's waning. And so if you place uh, such an ability, it, it moves to the infused uh, place. And uh, then if you use an ability that has a, like the element symbol, but with a cross on it, you can improve your ability if this, like the element symbol, but with a cross on it, you can improve your ability if this element is infused or um, waning on the battlefield, thereby removing it from the battlefield. Um, important, infusion happens after... Important, infusion happens after your turn. So you can't like, oh yeah, I play this ability which gives me this element and then I play this ability which uses the element. That doesn't work because infusion happens after you act it. And but if you have multiple player, you can uh, infuse the battlefield after you act it. And but if you have multiple player, you can uh, infuse the battlefield for the next player. Yeah, if you have the same elements. Like in my case, I played with one character which used uh, light and fire and the other used wind yeah this is um one of the quirks in jaws of the lion where the four can yeah this is um one of the quirks in jaws of the lion where the four characters don't have quite as much in the way of synergy when you play 
Gloomhaven and you have a lot of classes unlocked, you can put them together to set each other up with the right elements. Um, but Jaws of the Lion, by its nature of just having... F um, but Jaws of the Lion, by its nature of just having four characters, um, doesn't quite have that going as uh, as efficiently, at least in for the first portion. Yeah, and uh, and it's another part where you you know at the end of the turn, oh remember every element moves down one spot, and uh, if you play the and uh, if you play the card, oh remember to move the element up, and and then there's also the like okay yeah sure I infuse the next turn I can use it except the enemies also infuse and use elements so you might have just you know improved the next enemy attack um yeah it's it... <laughs> i i've only uh seen gloomhaven being played and it seemed like there was a lot of uh different uh aspect to handle and to manage uh the there's a reason why uh the game is uh, is known to be taking way too much space on the table. <laughs> Having to maintain the elements and keep a track of all of that. And you have to because even if your character is not going to use the elements, the enemies might do. I, I set up a PC next to the table I was playing it on and I just basically played it on the PC and mirrored it on the board game. <laughs> because and I realized you could just play it all on the app if you're doing this fan what what why and but doing this lets me look at the physical space and have cards in hand which I love holding cards um, yeah that's good I, I do yeah but then the computer is handling the elements and it's handling how the AI on the monsters is occurring reduced the low the mental load for me enough that I could start doing well in Gloomhaven because I can't do well in Gloomhaven if I have to operate all of the um, the, the, the AI section because um, it's just that there's a lot. Uh, so. Yep, I can definitely uh, see. There's, there's a fair RPGs and specifically video games RPGs that kind of feel like they were told of uh, the, the card and the way that the system works was... Um, Thought of as something that should be handled by a computer, but just like um, uh, moved on to cards. I don't know. So sometimes it kind of feels like uh, some of those systems would be better handled by uh, a phone or oh, yeah. a computer. Definitely. I, I, I mean, I think at least with, with Jaws of a Lion, it's not as much an issue if you play with two or three or four players because you just have more minds keeping with two or three or four players because you just have more minds keeping track of things. Um, but if you play alone, it's, it's, it really can be a lot, especially if you have, you know, alone, you have to control two characters. So um, you already have double the load. <laughs> it's uh, so um, you already have double the load. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. 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 There's um, it's, it's partially automated, but for Descent Second Edition, um, you can play uh, their Dungeon Dive Road to Legend thing. Uh, their Dungeon Dive Road to Legend thing, and you effectively have an automated GM DM doing all of the enemy stuff, and that lifts the load quite a bit as well for uh, for me. Um, I really like Descent Second Edition with the. Uh, the dungeon crawl, uh, mostly because it's not a dungeon crawl, it's a race. But yeah, yeah, a, def a good app um, handling stuff is super, super helpful at times, and it is a bit, a bit weird to pull out my Steam remote machine and be like, okay, here's here's the enemy, and every I have to duplicate. Yeah. It's it's how how I got through all of uh, Jaws of the Lion, um, in part because. Have we talked about the box yet? Because because <laughs> the box the box ki kind of sucks. <laughs> it's trying so hard, and I don't know how it manages to fail, but it does fail to hold everything. I mean, I actually managed to fit everything in the box without lid lift. Well, there is that. Well done, because I couldn't manage it. I didn't manage it um, the first time, but but now when I packed it away, it took me a while. But uh, did you use the shoe hold? No. No. <laughs> uh, did you use the shoe hold? No, no. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so uh, so uh, like from the volume of stuff fits inside the box. <laughs> yeah. 
you just have to be creative. Kind of. But I don't want to be creative. I'm here. For... Kind of. But I don't want to be creative. I'm here for an insert <laughs> to tell me how to do things. Yeah, I mean, I want the, the first time I, I tried, I, I unpacked everything and put everything in the bags as the, the which is nice. There is one sh pa paper uh, on the top, which basically tells you where to put everything and how to put pa a paper uh, on the top, which basically tells you where to put everything and how to put stuff in, in bags and whatnot. That's, that's a nice idea. The same. That was Yep, yep. That 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 was going to be similar to what I was just about to say as my point is if you've got a complicated storage system for your game, for sticking a this is where everything goes. Don't put it on the bottom inside of the box, which I have seen in certain circumstances because oh I've covered up the bottom of the box and I've still got half of the stuff to put in there. So yeah. It, it, just have it have a loose sheet's fine but i am gonna stick that loose sheet it's double-sided but um so yeah i did this and then i wanted to put it away so i put everything in the box and once the box was full i still had a big pile of uh bags with monster components uh lying there and i thought that sucks um so yeah I, it's you know, it's a small box kind of so it could have just been you know either have a better insert or just be slightly bigger um <laughs> but uh yeah 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 if it was about a centimeter taller i th think the problems would not be so so yeah anyway um personally i think it's a good game um if you are interested in gloomhaven but are afraid of like the price tag and the commitment and uh, whatnot i think jaws of the lion is a uh, good it has uh, basically the same uh, combat mechanic um, it plays in the same world and uh, if you really enjoy it you can still think if uh, to continue this experience is worth the price for gloomhaven yeah um i get a chime in and say i think better experience it's very clear that isaac improved and refined on feedback he'd received about the original Gloomhaven. He didn't put a stupid envelope X into this box, which, if you're ever curious, go and have a look about what Gloomhaven's envelope X is about. Um, it's, um, it's a ongoing meta puzzle uh, this throughout the whole of Gloomhaven. I'm not going to spoil how you solve it, except to say one of the answers you have to get from the Faku because they messed it up in the game. Yeah, yeah. And at the end of it all, when, w once I unlocked it, I was like, of it all, when, w once I unlocked it, I was like, I really needed to be able to unlock this like halfway through the campaign, not near the end where I am. I am not going to bother finishing this campaign now. Bye bye. I, I had actually uh, two question about uh, Joseph the Lions. Question about uh, Joseph the Lions. Uh, the first one is: um, Is any of it compatible with Gloomy? Yes. Or is it a completely uh, separate you can experience? use the characters from Joseph the Lion in your Gloomhaven campaign. Uh, if you, you know, want more campaign, uh, if you, you know, want more variation, like if you played the third campaign and just want to play a new I, I, I honestly don't know why people would need that, but uh, you can do it. Yeah, but it's always nice to know that it's... Um... It's something that you can... Uh... Uh, you can do it. Yeah, but it's always nice to know that it's... Um... It's something that you can uh, you can uh, staple onto. Yeah, uh, and it's, yeah, I was just say there's a couple of things you got to watch out for. Um, the demolitionist, uh, like you need to bring its destruction tokens in. To, like you need to bring its destruction tokens in to put them on destroyed obstacles. Um, and there's a few things like the red guard needs a little bit of a change, and you need to house rules some of the characters as counting as other things and also remember to like some of the items across yeah. um, it works better on the app the app has like full compatibility that it all does behind the hood that you don't worry about um, 
And as we're talking about the characters very briefly, I think we would be amiss if we didn't mention the number one most important thing to understand when you start playing Gloomhaven. I, I did this mistake because uh, I, when I, I looked at the box, uh, at the back of the box, there's like every character shown and shot less just like the title, I think. And there I already thought, oh, this Void Warden looks really cool. And then I, when I unboxed it and I looked at the characters and I read the, their stories and I was like, the Void Warden looks really cool. And then I read the rules and it said, oh yeah, if you play solo, play with two characters. Also, Void Warden is recommended for three to four players. And I was like, hmm, well, it says recommended. It doesn't say I can't do it. So, of <laughs> course, I played the Void Warden with, together with the character. What's it called? Um... That is the Red Guard. The Red Guard, the, yeah. The Valrath Red Guard. He's a devil. Yeah. Type so I, I played those two before the first scenario, and at the end of the first scenario, it basically said, "Oh yeah, by the way, this is the point where you should decide if you really want to keep these two characters you just had." Because like, okay, game, I got you. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's a bit of a shame because. The Valrath Red Guard, the Inox Hatchet, and the Quattrill Dem Demolitionist are all really, really good characters. And as far as starting characters go, I would put them on the level of fun for myself. Which is like, the, I really love playing the Cragheart um, when starting out in Gloomhaven. So those three are great. And it is, it is just a bit of a shame um, that they, like, I feel like the Void Warden would have been better served being in the core game uh, as an unlock. And they could have porters or built a new character for Jaws of the Lion, who wasn't so, so like, I need at least two people to do stuff with. Otherwise, I, I can't function. And ideally, I want three people to target. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it, I, I think it does fill an important role, you know, like the supporting character, but just fill an important role, you know, like the supporting character. But just for our listeners who don't know what we're talking about, basically a lot of the Void Warden's abilities are like, oh yeah, give someone else an extra action. Or, oh yeah, um, you can ah, heal yes. two targets and stuff like that. And if you only have one character standing there and it's kind of stuff like that. And if you only have one character standing there and it's kind of, nah. <laughs> Yeah, the Void Warden kind of needed to be able to target herself, I think, with, like, explicitly everything, so she could function without doing stuff um, with others, without doing stuff um, with others. Uh, as I said, we've, we've played on the app, on the Steam game, and we've played the Void Warden in the main campaign on that, and we played three-player, and she functioned. She was a little, like, felt a little bit like she was struggling. A little, like, felt a little bit like she was struggling at times to do things. But on the most part, she felt a lot better there than she did in Gloomhaven. Which is, as I said, it's a shame. Because she is cool. Oh, yeah. That's uh, Jaws of the Lion. That's promising for uh, Frost Lion. That's promising for uh, Frosthaven. Yeah, yep. Yeah. I mean, Frosthaven's due to start shipping sometime early 2023, I think, if I remember correctly. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm on it. But I will say that Frosthaven does need to really wow well done with the Gloomhaven series. Um, because I had to learn a whole new playstyle to play it. And sometimes I still find myself going, is this way of playing fun? And I'm not sure, but as I said, Isaac keeps evolving his designs and improving them, so maybe. Is a reference sheet for like how a uh, turn works. Because you do have reference cards for the different statuses, but the, the problem is you have two rule books. One is the reference book, which, you know, that's like, oh yeah, you can look up keywords and stuff. And one is the actual rule book, which works. You don't have that. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the community um, tends to provide those things. So, yeah. but it's a complaint I had about Oathsworn, where Oathsworn had a number of things buried in the book um, that really needed to be on a separate sheet. Uh, Stars of Vicarious, which I've mentioned a few times, and they just spread out slightly one item spills onto a second page. And I was just like, why couldn't you have relayed this and, you know, re given this a new layout? 
and condensed everything slightly and given us a separate sheet. Because I want to just have the book closed at the back of the book, have it in a reference of how to play the book closed at the back of the book, have it in a reference of how to play everything, and then have a reference sheet for any tokens or other bits and pieces like that. And only have to open the book for specific edge case or nitty gritty stuff. So yeah, it's uh, meh. Uh, but uh, I think it's... Uh, that, uh, but uh, I think it's... Uh, that's... Any final words on nope, Jaws of nope, the Lion? No. You're done? Um, and could you recommend it for people? Um, as I said, if you're like hovering around Gloomhaven and uh, not sure, just get Jaws of the Lion. Um, and uh, not sure, just get Jaws of the Lion. Um, I kind of enjoy it. I would rate it, I think, at like a 7 or so on Board Game Geek. So, um, yeah. Okay, fantastic. So, uh, let us go on our last journey uh, as a Lexistic. So, uh, let us go on our last journey uh, as Alexis is going to take us to some exciting radio telescope equipment and uh, similar in the search for Planet X. Um, before I hand off to uh, Alexis, Planet X is a uh, Alexis. Planet X is a theoretical planet in orbit in the Kuiper Belt, or Kuiper Belt, depending whether you're British or American, that's the two pronunciations. So it's like quite far out, and there's, in our solar system, weird stuff happening with the outermost planets, and weird stuff happening with the outermost planets, and also out in the Kuiper Belt as well, there's odd stuff there. I think I might just call it Kuiper Belt going ahead because I don't like the British pronunciation. So I've always heard Kuiper Belt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kuiper Belt is is it, 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 it's awful, but it does sound like a fun toy. Anyway, uh, enough of that because I just love astronomy so much. I just wanted to mention it was 2015 that they started to theorize this. We've not found it yet, but Alexis, uh, you are actually here. You're not theoretical, so go ahead. Ah, so. Uh, it's actually good that you have a bunch of little, um, uh, ah, how do you say that uh, in, uh, in English? Uh, bat page, uh, like under um, under page, like uh, under script on uh, the at, bottom of a page. At the bottom of the page, uh, uh, yeah, foot, yeah uh, footnotes. 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 There's a bunch of little footnotes about actual, uh, it's interesting. So as, uh, as Fen explained, there's a very probably an extra planet in the... Uh, outside ring of the solar system, beyond the reach of our instruments, kind of hi hidden. And the whole idea of Planet X is that it's a deduction game uh, using astronomical knowledge to some, uh, using astronomical knowledge to search uh, for the possible location of Planet X. Um, so I find that as a very fun idea for a deduction game. It's not about... Uh, uh, some kind of murder mystery, but about like uh, the the possible kind of murder mystery, but about like uh, the the possible location of a, an astronomical object. Uh, you'd think that finding a planet is easier than that, um, and it uses an app to randomize the mystery, uh, which I'll talk in a minute. So the way that the game works is pretty interesting, as you have a a space. So the way that the game works is pretty interesting, as you have a a space map. Uh, showing off the different sector of the solar system. Uh, one side of the board shows 12, the other uh, 18 for expert game, which I like because it allows you to, uh, first of all, I always like double-sided board, I think. Once you know the game better, or if you have uh, more than enough player, you can uh, you can just turn the, the map over and, you, uh, and use it. Uh, so the game is played between one, two, four player. You know the amount uh, and the type of the different uh, celestial object in the sky, as well as uh, six in an expert game, I think. And you know that asteroids have to be next to another asteroid. So if there's only four, you know that there's either two pairs of two or one band of four. You cannot have a lone asteroid. So if you find one on the map, you know that on its left or on its right, they will be that way. Uh, you know that they are... Uh, that the gas clouds are always next to an empty sector. Uh, you, you have a 
those few rules that help you uh, start trying to picture where things are in the sky. And uh, the mysterious planet X appears as an empty X appears as an empty sector uh, if scanned uh, and can only be revealed to end the game. So each turn you can pick one of four actions and each action has its own time cost. Uh, for example, doing a target scan of a sector that tells you exact for example, doing a target scan of a sector that tells you exactly what's in that sector will cost you four uh, quote unquote time units, making you advance uh, full space onto the circular board. Uh, while a long range scan that gives you the amount of a type of item in the sector long range scan that gives you the amount of a type of item in the sector that you're scanning costs only two times unit. And the idea is that the active player is always the one that is the most back in time, uh, quote unquote. So possibly you could have to let other people play twice before you get another turn. Took a more costly action. So I think that this is a very interesting mechanic for a deduction game where you have a few actions that give you uh, more accurate or more important information and you kind of have to uh, mitigate that if you want to be able to find things faster. If you play, you'll uncover more rules about the system. Um, for example, you can discover that uh, in this game there are no asteroids around the dwarf planet. Uh, so if you find a dwarf planet, you know that there's not going to be any uh, asteroids uh, around it. So if you find an asteroid, you know that the dwarf told you by the app. So for every action that you do, you use the app to reveal different hints that you get then mark down on your sheet in front of you. Uh, that's probably the thing that I'm a bit more miffed about the game is that it relies very heavily on the app. And obviously for a deduction game like this, it's it's kind of hard to use cards to generate uh, properly accurate uh, rules and give out information and I can understand that it was probably a lot easier to make an app than to have a complicated system like I think that we talked about uh, about in the past about an invited guest we talked about uh, about in the past about an invited guest uh, is that right Fem? yep uh, yep we have yeah yep. Uh, which is a game that uses a very complicated uh, mattress at the back of the book that gives you uh, dozens of different uh, uh, dozens of different uh, game configuration telling you which card to pick and you basically have to search through the decks to figure out uh, how to build the mystery out of that. It's it's a good system to get around an app, but I don't think that it's uh, more satisfying. Them to get around an app, but I don't think that it's uh, more satisfying um, in some ways. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to find a game that managed to uh, figure something out, something easier than either of those options. Anyway, in the search of Planet X, uh, you can, for example, like do research to that will reveal more of that. You can. Uh, you can, for example, like do research to that will reveal more of that. You can do scans that will tell you what's in the system. Uh, and as the game progresses, you're going to have uh, the option to uh, emit a theory for what's in a sector. And at the end of the game, uh, the player that had the most uh, game, uh, the player that had the most uh, right theories will win the game. Um, knowing that obviously finding the planet X is what gives you the most points, but it's not always enough to win if that's the only thing that you manage to do. Uh, one thing that time mechanics comes in uh, also when trying to find, uh, to find, uh, to, to gain points, because if you emitted a theory first, before it was uh, properly revealed, yeah, another player emits the same theory. Well, that other player is also going to get points, have a chance to emit a, a theory on Planet X, and depending on their uh, position on the map, so how far back they are uh, uh, next to the, the first player, they can emit a theory and they will get some points regarding Planet X, but a little bit less if they are uh, for the aspect of. Um, uh, other deduction game. 
Uh, the only problem really for me is that it, it uses uh, so much, uh, it relies on the, the app so much. Uh, sometimes, I don't know, I, I like playing a board game, having to be on my phone to, to try and... Uh, uh, what did you, what did you thought about it, Carl? Um, first of all, what I just thought, they, they chose the name of the game pretty well. Um, because technically it's the ninth planet. Um, if you are part of those crazy people who think planet, um, if you are part of those crazy people who think Pluto is not a planet anymore. So, um, they could have gone with search for planet nine, but they chose planet X. X is Roman numeral for 10. But they could also say, well, no, no, it doesn't mean 10. It's just, you know, this Roman numeral for 10. But they could also say, well, no, no, it doesn't mean 10. It's just, you know, X as a variable, as an unknown. So, so they can, can argue both ways. So no matter who um, reads the title, they can interpret it the right way. Um, so pr pretty well, nice. <laughs> Well, well, just just to interpret it the right way. Um, so uh, pr pretty well, nice. <laughs> well, well, just just to chip in there, um, the uh, astro astrologers, okay, no astronomers, astronomers um, actually uh, nickname it Planet Nine. So the board game really name it Planet Nine. So the board game really should have been called Search for Planet Nine, but Planet X is fine for the mystery. I think that they should have called it the search for a Nibiru, uh, which is the uh, imaginary name of uh, the 12th planet of the solar system. Imaginary name of uh, the 12th planet of the solar system uh, thought of by conspiracy theorists that think that it's uh, the planet of some weird aliens that came to Earth uh, sometimes. Um, you can find more information on that on your uh, local conspiracy theorist uh, yeah. web, uh, local conspiracy theorist uh, yeah. website. But just to be clear, they're wrong because the alien space race that keeps messing around with Earth is um, the Migo. It's the fungi from Yogoth, or also known as Pluto. So there we are. Okay. Anyway, so the game uh, I re um, hey, which uh, what do I know and what don't I know and um, where can I say, oh yeah, that's definitely not there. And somewhere during the game, I had this revelation when I thought, wait, if I place the token wrong at some point, I have no way if you keep, keep really good notes of what you're doing and what you know. Um, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a nice, not too complicated logic puzzle. Um, and as, as you said, you know, with the research action, you can get more clues. I'm here. I do wonder, I don't know if, if you know, can you download this app to your phone so you don't need an internet connection? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know, but I'm going to give you an answer in 30 seconds as I'm looking. Through yeah, just as an explanation, I think I mentioned it. An answer in 30 seconds as I'm looking. Through yeah, just as an explanation, I think I mentioned it before in some episode. Um, in my board game room, I have very spotty internet. Um, so, and so that's, that's good because as soon as I have an, have an app, that has to be connected to the internet. That's good because as soon as I have an, have an app that has to be connected to the internet, I can't really use it reliably in my board gaming room. And I don't uh, want to buy a Wi-Fi uh, uh, extender just to cover my board game room. Buy a Wi-Fi uh, uh, extender just to cover my board game room because it's for board gaming and not for watching YouTube videos on my phone. Um, yeah, but yeah, um, I don't know if it would be possible to pack. Um, I don't know if it would be possible to pack what the app does in like cards or a book. I think it might be difficult. Um, yeah, but um, it's it would be pretty difficult. Yeah, but um, it's 
it would be pretty difficult because it would require um i don't know like a lot of cards a, a lot of different cards and different card combination being uh ended out at different times and uh ended out at different times and probably a system similar to uh an intended guest but i i still think that there's for the way that the game function there's no good way around it but there's probably a better system for the addiction game to hide it better for maybe with some times of like rotating dial or something like that uh, i don't yeah. know I, ju I just thought you know if you look if you guess where planet x is you have to basically say oh yeah in the left sector of it is this and there's this and that's already pretty hard to do with cards without giving on half um so yeah. i the best way that I could see it for, uh, working would be with the game master, uh, which you know takes the the rule of our the the rule of our, an app, uh, basically. So now we figured out basically game masters are glorified apps, which makes me wonder: can we just use an app? Someone well, should get onto of, that uh, because that's the big. There's plenty of GM less. Yeah, but that's the big issue with role playing games, right? Finding a game master. If someone could develop a Dungeons and Dragons game master app which the players could use damn that would sell a lot i think well i think that a lot of game master will tell you that uh, their biggest issue is uh to have players and that they would have a lot more fun without them so, <laughs> so um, yeah but yeah the, the, the game i i liked it i had this one point during the game where i felt like knew everything so i figured everything out and the game wasn't done yet, which felt kind of weird to me because it was like, I know everything. Why are we still playing? But um, yeah, that's a really small issue I have. Um, yeah, the, the Planet X has been discovered. Um, and the thing is that by usually it's found, uh, once one player finds it, uh, the other players are usually maybe one turn behind, uh, maybe two if things are not going well. Yeah, well, it's, um, it's actually, it, the, it, the, the game doesn't end when one player found it. The game ends when one player confirmed they found it. And I was at the point, okay, yeah, I know everything. So now you two have your turns and then I get to confirm that I actually found it and then you two get two more turns and, and then I get to confirm that I actually found it and then you two get two more turns and that was kind of like, ah. <laughs> yeah, um, it's it's very, it's a very uh, interesting little game, the, the distribution aspect and something that I really like, a very uh, interesting little game, the, the distribution aspect and something that I really like about it is that it uses um, uh, astronomy as a team. I think that there's there's a lot of game happening in space, but not a lot of game that are uh, astronomical, uh, as in in more uh, astronomical, uh, as in in more of the the like the cosmic um, uh, movement uh, types thing, rather than just having the stars as a background. Uh, so I think that it's a it's a great gift game for someone that likes uh, astronomy on planets gift game for someone that likes uh, astronomy on planets or something like that um yeah overall i i like it quite a lot uh and i think that it's uh, for a deduction game it's probably my my best recommendation uh um, because too often they are a bit uh, uh um, because too often they are a bit uh hard to to handle uh, yeah, uh, I don't have much to say about it because it's a, it's a very uh, small game compared to uh, Eva Field or uh, Jaws of the, uh, of the Lion that takes each uh, 40 mm -hmm. plus hours. Um, I'm going to mention it here because we talked about uninviting guests. Uh, Scandalo, if you can find it, is an improvement on the uninvited guests mechanic as an alternative. Um, so that it's it's about trashy journalism instead of... Uh, a murder or searching for planets. Okay, so so the title is Scandal Ho. 
uh, with OH and an exclamation point. That's pretty great. Uh, I'm going to have a look at that at some point because that's pretty good. Thanks uh, for the yeah. recommendation. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it, it's uh, arrived on Kickstarter for me. Uh, I got it from. It works really well mechanically. It's step up from the previous. So yeah. Yeah, an invited guest is is very fun. Um, I just the the card management for me is a bit uh, is a bit much sometimes. Um, but I should play more of it. One um, advice I can like me and thought of while listening to, to um, Alexis explain the game and Fan explaining the whole plan, uh, new planet uh, thing. Um, start googling after for a pl tenth planet, um, and you think, well, they already found it. Look at the date of the article, planet, um, and you think, well, they already found it. Look at the date of the article, um, because yes, in two thousand five, NASA found the tenth planet, which turned out to be Eris, another dwarf planet. So, um, yeah. That's really important in science. Always off planet. So, um, yeah. That's really important in science. Always look at the date of a paper. <laughs> yeah, and always remember that science can revise its opinion on anything. That's a big important one to note. That is, the whole aim of science is to constantly question. And note that is, the whole aim of science is to constantly question. And even if you think you have something definitive, it might not be. I mean, heck, look at what they're doing with the particle accelerators and the things they're finding now. It's incredible. Except in math. Math is always right and consistent and doesn't change. Math is great. Yeah. Always right and consistent and doesn't change. Math is great. Yeah. So what's, um, what's is it factor, factorial of zero? That's a really sensible one. I think it's... Well, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The fact the factorial of zero is one, um, which is great. Yeah. I love that. It's really consistent on the rules, but not logical. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, uh, yes, it works. So it works. Are you sure? But yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think with that, it's that's all we got time for, um, and this particular episode. Uh, and uh, hopefully, there's something in these three games we've talked about that's uh, a pretty solid recommendation for the search for Planet X. If you enjoy logic puzzles, yeah, yeah. So that discovery means this is all we have time for in this episode. You can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash the last dandy bye from belgium cara auf wiederhören and myself and remember that the second e in standy is for exploration <laughs> <laughs>